Today's episode is pulled from the archives. It was a much more simple time. COVID-19 did not exist, and I was in Anaheim, California. It was January of 2019, and I was in about day three of the NAMM show. I'd lost my voice, I was losing my mind, and slowly hating guitar. So I grabbed my good friend Jamie Stillman. We escaped together to my rental home across the street, and I interviewed him about my favorite Earthquaker pedals and his story of how Earthquaker started. It's a riveting masterpiece of documentary information about one of my favorite people, one of my friends, and one of my favorite pedal companies. So grab some popcorn, Grab a loved one, grab some gummy worms, Sour Patch Kids, and just pretend you're at the movie and enjoy today's presentation of Who is Earthquaker Devices? Let's roll the footage. So the first part, I guess, into this camera, just introduce yourself. That camera. <laughs> that camera. <laughs> now it's time for me to be uncomfortable. I am Jamie Stillman from Earthquaker Devices. And I'm uncomfortable. We're gonna, we're gonna dig in to go Dr. Phil on you, okay? Yes, please. All right, so when did music first become important to you? Uh, as long as I can remember. My parents have a recording of me from like, when I was like three, singing Hard Day's Night and beating on hat boxes. And like, I, I have a photo of me with my first drum set when I was like five in Christmas at Christmas. I can't remember a time where I wasn't a musician. That's cool. Are your parents musicians? Or? No, that's the weird part. But when I was younger, we lived at my grandparents' house, and my mom's side of the family is huge. And uh, my uncle had a band there in the basement, and I've got a couple other uncles who play uh, instruments. But my uncle Danny, who uh, his son Corey Juba works at Earthquaker. Okay. He's the one in all the videos. He's Eric Quincy Davis in the Swiss Things videos. But his dad taught me how to play guitar and drums when I was real young. That's cool. Yeah, my no one in my family either. It's a strange thing. Like my parents can't even operate a radio. <laughs> my dad was way into music, though. Uh, I think he could play drums a little bit. I remember him like annoying okay. the shit out of us in the like basement. Like the white boy beat. Like <laughs> yeah, like he would come down and like want to play Foxy Lady. <laughs> And I had one friend who could do it, so they would play drums. Yeah, my my dad only listened to like Marty Robbins. Oh wow! Like gunfighter ballads on repeat, yeah. like every day of his life. My dad, they, they, my parents listened to good music, but I didn't realize it until way later. Like they listened to like New York Dolls and T Rex and Black Sabbath and stuff, but I just thought of it as old people's music until I probably just turned into an old person. Yeah, and he's like, oh, I like all those bands, and to me, they're kind of wild still. How would you define dad rock? I don't know anymore because I like all of that stuff and I'm a dad, so it's, yeah, it's just... pretty much anything. I kind of feel like it's like that depressing band that's like, everything is almost like a cover band like that does like 38 Special and it's almost all perfect, but there's just something where it's not like totally cohesive. I notice people are labeling like Wilco or the National. Or... Yeah, I don't think that's dad rock. Yeah. I don't know, if you would ask me 20 years ago, I would tell you I don't like stuff like that because I was way more into like punk rock stuff. But then and now you're a dad. <laughs> but now I'm a dad and now the National is good. I don't know. Uh, what were the bands or the artists when you got into guitar that, you know, what's the stuff you were into trying to learn? Uh, Van Halen. Really? Yeah. I that's didn't see that. Extreme. Wow. The first song I ever learned on guitar was More Than Words. <laughs> uh, this is revealing. I was way in the, like, that kind of hair metal when I started playing guitar. And like started to hate it, discovered like punk rock. I'm like that jerk who like by the time Nirvana came out, like I was way into bands that played to like four people in a basement mm -hmm. and like no one knew about it but me. And I was like, that's what I like. Nirvana's terrible. And now like as an adult have to go back and be like, yeah, it was pretty good. I don't know what my problem is. <laughs> what are a couple of those punk bands? The one that changed me was called Born Against. I saw Born Against when I was like 15, 16, something like that. And I was like, yeah, 
that's what I like now. And they're like a weird band. Like if you go back and listen to it, it's definitely like got like a, a Black Flag meets Kiss kind of vibe to it. But it's like a train wreck that is all like in your face at all times and kind of like antagonistic. And that's what I always liked. Like the louder and more terrifying the band is, like the more I'm like, yeah. And that's still how I am. But now you listen to the National. Now I love the National. Now I like will willingly put on bread. Right. <laughs> the Dispatch Master. I'll let you hold it so you know you have that. Dispatch Master. I think it's the f first, like, real digital, I guess, pedal beyond the PT 2399. We had just gotten a bunch of FB1s and I was trying to see what it could do. I know, like, the Rainbow Machine was actually made before it like, came out after it, I think. At the time, there were no delay and reverb pedals that were real small. Except, I mean, the RV3 had like a real good name. I think Boss was making another one at that point, but there was nothing like it. And I was like, it sounds super good <laughs> and it's really easy to make. And it kind of fills that hole, at least it did for me. And then it like, you know, kind of took off right away. I think that this was the pedal that made it so we could move out of the basement. That's the first one I ever bought. Yeah. I played it and I plugged it up and I think it had all the knobs at noon. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment where I was like, oh, that's doing what I use these three pedals together to do. Right. Yeah. And I was like, all right. And I feel like that's what everyone's general reaction is. It's like, what, <laughs> you know, you can put the knobs anywhere and it just doesn't sound bad ever. Mm -hmm. It's still one of our most popular pedals. Yeah, I see it everywhere. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And people still feel compelled to tell me what I should do with it. Like tap tempo? Yeah, put tap tempo on it. Why isn't it stereo? There needs to be tails. Oh, well. Octaves. Octaves. That would be cool. Talk about Relaxer, the Earthquaker Devices band. Yeah, well, it started out as not an Earthquaker Devices band, but eventually morphed into just everybody who <laughs> works at Earthquaker. How many members are in Relaxer? Four. Okay. But when it started, there's I'm the only original member of this band, and that feels weird. We've been around for seven years. We've written 13 songs. We barely do anything, but... Uh, it's, I guess, just my musical outlet. But it started from, like, I was in this band Drummer with Pat from the Black yeah. Keys, and he got busy with the Black Keys, so the rest of us started to play. And then, like, everybody sort of fell apart. And then me and Steve Clements, who used to work at Earthquaker, he played keyboards. We just played for a while, went through a series of drummers, and eventually we just kind of, people from Earthquaker found their way in. I feel like... Every band that I've ever been in starts out with the intention of being something a little bit more experimental or like long-winded and just devolves into being a metal band. And like none of us want to be in a metal band, but it's sort of like, it just turns into it every time. So like now Relaxer is kind of just like a heavy, sludgy band with like a little bit of atmospheric elements to it where it used to just be all, like the idea was to have these like long drown out like kind of cinematic prog rocky yes close to the edge was like my i was like that's the kind of band that i want to be in and it was headed that way for a minute and now it's just like oh who has time let's just just play, play these riffs really loud and put a bunch of fog and lights around and like it, it works but i feel like it's you know morphing into something now you mentioned uh, Pat, so the band drummer. So I had no clue you were a part of that. Yeah. So I've gotten to know him over the last year, just a little bit, texting mm -hmm. and stuff. So you have a history with the Black Keys. Yeah. Some people may not realize that. Yeah. yeah. I knew Pat before he was in that band. I met him when he was really young, and I kind of fell into my job with them, which like started as a person who, like, 
I was in a band for a long time and we toured just as much and like Black Hughes and my band got signed at the same time and their band took off and mine didn't. And uh, it was called the Party of Helicopters, it was my band. And uh, we had broken up like right when they started to get really big and I had nothing to do. I was just drinking coffee and listing all of my belongings on eBay. Uh, and they hired me to drive their gear from Akron to Seattle. And uh, like I went with them for a couple days and like watched what was going on. Pretend to be your tech and tour manager and then it turned into like, I am really your tour manager now. And that lasted for like five years. Wow, I've, I've heard you talk, we've been on panels and stuff and I hear a little bit of your story. I don't know all the details, but uh, is that where you started making pedals for Dan or was uh, there some? No, that was, it was probably around that same time. It was like, two, like my band had just broken up and I was like getting my shit together to do something else. And like, that was really, like I had always been into like pedals, but never thought anything of it. Just thinking about this is kind of funny to me because like, it's just 2003, I didn't know anything. I, at that point, I'd been touring for 10 years playing guitar in a band. And like, I didn't know like why one person's guitar sounded different than others. And like I toured, I had crazy gear for like the kind of like playing in a house like smaller than this room and I had like two Marshall full sticks and like all these pedals and stuff and that was totally unheard of at the time for like punk rock bands. So like what is that? It's like a delay pedal. Like are you crazy? Like yeah. So like I had all this stuff, didn't understand it and then like I started to get really obsessed with gear like right when the band broke up and I collected all these pedals and I had this old BW 250 and it broke and I bought a new one to replace it and it didn't sound like the old one so I looked it up on General Guitar Gadgets how to fix it yep. and that's what started it. But that was like right around the time where I think I kind of really started working for them. It was a good like test like here do you want this and he wouldn't use anything, it didn't matter. I'd just give it to him. The Eruptor. Mm -hmm. So I got this. It's amazing. Thanks. The one knob distortion. Essentially, it's a super elaborate version of a fuzz face with like a transformer pickup simulation in it, which I read about on some DIY forum. Works great. Uh, buffered. And that kind of gives it a little bit more clarity. But if you play through a fuzz face, you turn both of those knobs all the way up because Every that's time. the only way it actually sounds good. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need them. Also, it turns out when you take those out, like the pedal just sounds better in general. Like mm -hmm. it's, there's no more filter on the output. So I would, the bias is a center detail right there. I think I know, it's perfect it so for that. Uh, I made several very elaborate versions before. I was like, just needs this one control. This one control is the best one. So how did you end up being the creator owner of a pedal company? I don't like, know. <laughs> the same way that I feel like I do anything, I don't have, you know, how it goes. Like, mm. I didn't have any expectations for like anything that I did. I really had no plans beyond, oh, I'm just gonna be in a band for my whole life. I went to school for graphic design. I had a job for graphic design, but even when I had it, I was like, well, I'm just gonna eventually just be in a band. I mean, I feel like it's probably the same for you, but like it worked in the way the business doesn't work anymore. It was like right. old timey, like word of mouth. So yeah. like I had like a hot dog stand that accidentally turned into a restaurant or something. That's where I'm just standing there with hot dogs and all of the people are like, your hot dogs are great, make more hot dogs. And then I open a restaurant and then get my wife to handle it because she's smarter than me. <laughs> yeah. What are your pedal influences? So like oh. things that you just think are amazing and... Maestro stuff, love all that stuff. The first era of DOD, I would say, was a huge influence. Death by Audio, 
obsessed with him. Like, just that was like the first like thing where I was like, their pedals look like the flyers I used to make, and I was like, that looks cool. I just want to, I don't care what they do. Yeah. What, what Earthquaker pedal, or maybe a couple, what are you most proud of? I don't know. <laughs> Everything until the second it's ready to be released. Rainbow Machine, Arpanoid, Arpanoid for sure is, I think I've talked about it a bunch, where it's like, that was the thing where I was like, the only time where I was like, people's heads are gonna explode, and then people were like, Man, it doesn't have tap tempo. I every time I play through it, I'm still blown away. But like, there's an odd thing with I, I've said this several times. A few of my absolute favorite things I've done that are like really original, like stuff that was just completely, you know, like pull things out of the cabinet, do something fresh. Mm -hmm. People don't really buy it. But I put out a tube screamer with nine modes. Right. And they buy the crap out of exactly. it. Exactly. But they say they don't want the tube screamer. Right. People don't know what they want anymore. <laughs> I think like it's always kind of proof. Like people are like, yawn, tube screamer. But you've probably sold a billion of those yeah. pedals. And like no one wants to admit that they have it or that that's what they actually wanted. They're like, when's someone gonna do something new and original? Like I, you know, and you know people watching like that no one knows what really what they want until they get to play through it and like whether or not it speaks to them. Thanks so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I am a massive fan of Earthquaker pedals. I think they're amazing, but I'm an even bigger fan of Jamie and Julie who created and run Earthquaker. They're amazing people. They've been great friends to me over the years. They've helped me, we've helped them, and they're a beautiful part of this amazing pedal community that I love to call home. So I'd love for you in the comments to tell me what your favorite Earthquaker pedal is, the one that you'd love to buy. Let's talk about it. Also, go check out their stuff and go buy an Earthquaker pedal. Right now, if you're wanting to buy a pedal, don't buy a JHS, go buy an Earthquaker. I love these people to death, so go support them. They are A++. So if you like the episode, hit like. Oh, and by the way, I know there was no record time, so put the guns away, but go listen to Relaxer. That's the band that I love. That's Jamie's band. I have the vinyl, it's not here at home, but go listen to it. It's epic. Hit like if you like the episode. Subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon to get notifications of future episodes. Have a wonderful day and maybe we'll do this more. I got a lot of footage in the archives. Maybe we will. Bye-bye.